with Akitunde on my left. My first question will go to you. This is essentially um, a panel conversation to help more people understand the work you're doing and also your motivation. So I'm going to redirect my question by saying that through your work at LESEF, you are pushing policies and creating opportunities for young people. And uh, I want to really know, what is your motivation for leaving a corporate job, you know, especially when you were in the bank and now you're in public service? What is it that motivates you to do this sort of career switch? And what are you doing at LSEF today? Uh, thanks a lot. So, so Patrick has stolen my thunder because um, I was going to use the whole thing about when my son was born. Um, <laughs> but now it sounds, I sound like a copycat. Um, but you know, so at Standard Bank, Standard Bank was great, right? Um, it, was really, it was really exciting, it was a great job. But I was doing, I was supporting small businesses effectively to earn a fairly decent bonus, right? So, you know, it, it was great. I met tons of businesses, it was exciting. But I felt like we could do a lot more. Um, but as you know, when you work for a financial institution, uh, there's only so much risk you can take with shareholders uh, capital or depositors funds. Um, so when, when the current governor was um, running for office, um, he asked me to help him do some work around SME policy, etc. Uh, and I did that and walked away from it. Um, but then, you know, I got a phone call and the phone call was effectively, come see me tomorrow. And the meeting was effectively <coughs> this employment trust fund that I've set up you know, how about you come run it? And my answer was no, you know, um, wrong time, blah, blah, blah. And then I got blackmailed. Um, and then he said to me, you know, the problem with you young people, uh, and I don't think I'm a young person, um, but I was maybe 35 at the time. And he said to me, you know, the problem with you young people is that you know how to talk, you write all these great policy documents. Then we say, come and do the work. Then you say, you know, my bonus, you know, my wife, my holidays, you know. I'm not, so, so but for me, I thought it was great. One was that it was something that hadn't been done before. Um, and, we, and I felt that it was a great opportunity to set a marker um, and to pr build something that hopefully people could then learn from and improve, um, et cetera. So, so that was the motivation, really. It was really a case of, look, there's a, there's a great opportunity to support even more businesses um, and especially to show people, hopefully younger than me, um, that we can actually go into government and do this work properly. Um, and so for many years we've heard, you know, you're too young. So like Patrick said, you know, I get told, you know, I'm too young to run for governor. I'm too young to run for president. And I felt, look, this is, an, this is a great opportunity to say whatever you leave us with, we will do. And to show to people that age should not be um, a restriction to doing work or working in public service. Now to what we do at the Employment Trust Fund, um, we effectively support small to medium enterprise. In fact, let me backtrack. We're effectively supporting job creation in Lagos State. Um, and it's a realization that you know, a lack of jobs is pretty much Nigeria's biggest socioeconomic problem. For those of you that know the stats, 40% of our population are either out of work or underemployed. When you slice that for the youth population, it's 52%. So it's a really serious situation. Um, and for, for us, it's a realization that if we don't solve that problem, there are loads of other problems that we lay on that. Things around security, things around productivity, um, even all these consumer bets that the large corporates are taking. They are taking those bets saying disposable income will rise. Therefore, all of this emerging markets story we're telling is all is all built on being able to create jobs. So our role is to support small businesses to grow um, and create jobs. And on the flip side, it's to also help upscale um, what you might call a fairly unskilled youth population to allow them to take up existing jobs in the state. Thanks. All right, thank you so very much for this. Um, I heard one thing very clear, was that you were creating value when you got offered this job. And I think it speaks a lot about the value system that we have in Nigeria today, why it's important. We say there is no job, but when you create value, then jobs will chase you. That's one thing I think I should leave out there. But before I even continue the session, I want to quickly say that 
we should send for our questions. Uh, we don't want to wait till the end so that we can manage our time effectively. So if you have questions for Aki today, knowing that it was coming today, and also for the other people on the panel, please send them forward now, and then we'll take them as we go. I'm going to also um, direct my next questions to Folawe now. Um, I've known you for a while, and <laughs> yes, it's interesting to see that you've established a career for yourself. A career for yourself in the development sector. Um, for anyone who has met you, like I have, it's obvious that you have commitment to education. And I'm very interested to know, and also for the sake of our guest today, how is Teach for Nigeria empowering um, Nigerians, really, to ensure that there is equitable education for every Nigerian child? So there's a backstory to teach for Nigeria, and um, I'll just share a bit of that. My background is international law and diplomacy, and I'd set out to become a diplomat. I'd done my master's degree in diplomatic relations, and the plan was for me to become um, a career ambassador in Nigeria. And so I returned to Nigeria after my master's, and I found myself in a school. I never thought anything else but diplomacy would take, would, I'll be so passionate about anything else but diplomacy. But I joined this Montessori school in Lekki, somewhere here in Lagos. Um, and one day, an orphan child was enrolled in that school. And this child was around five years old. Um, I was a school administrator at the Montessori school. And I remember that the teachers came and would, you know, they were struggling with how this little girl, Udo Amaka, could have been enrolled at the school. We struggled with thinking how this girl will blend in with the other kids. Like the difference with her and the other kids in the school was like day and night. And so what I experienced in six months, which was about two terms, was a transformation that I didn't believe could ever happen. And so I'm driving from Lekki, going to the mainland where I used to live in Ilupeju, and the kids who are on the road begging for arms and trying to clean my windscreen and just trying to beg for food, I will then begin to picture them in my school, thinking, so are you saying to me that if all of these kids were brought into the school, this is the same way their lives will transform? And so it wasn't enough for me to remain as the school administrator. And at the point, I had gone and enrolled for the Montessori. So the big plan for me was to start my own uh, Montessori school. And so I left there, and I joined this organization whose vision was that one day every Nigerian child would have access to uh, quality education. And when I joined the organization, we would organize conferences and workshops, but this was all for the high-brow schools in Nigeria. And so I would challenge the board and I'll say to the president, how are we reaching all of the children if we're only working with schools like the Corona, the Grange, and all of these other high-brow schools? And so one day, I heard about Teach for Nigeria. And Teach for Nigeria was um, about to recruit um, a CEO for the organization. Um, and I was only 27 at the point. But then I took the leap of faith and I applied to the role. Um, I remember someone saying to me, Falawe, you're too young for this role. We're looking for someone who is experienced, someone who will be able to navigate the corridors of government and stakeholders, et cetera. And so you're, you, know, you could probably come later on when the, the organization is fully set up, but they're probably not going to take you on. Anyway, fast forward a couple of months, I was brought into the organization as a program manager and the CEO was hired, Teach for Nigeria had gone through two CEOs, excellent people, very well experienced. And then when I joined four months down the line, the CEO left. And um, obviously I was not left with, the, you know, with my commitment, my passion to really ensure that Teach for Nigeria um, really did launch. Um, and Teach for Nigeria really was burst out of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group in 2013. This was the year when Nigeria was announced as the country with the largest number of out-of-school children in the world. It was also the year when there was a survey had been done and then we realized that 60% of the kids who were in primary six couldn't read or write, whether in English or their native language. It was also the year when we had done an assessment of our WIAC results and seen that less than 30% pass rate across the nation over the past 10 years. And so it was one of the, um, the summit looked at how do we urgently address these issues and look at interventions to solve it. And so this committee came together and they started working on the idea. So I became the CEO of Teach for Nigeria in February 2016. Um, obviously, a lot of people didn't think it was going to work. They said there was no way you're going to get government to partner with you. Um, they said to us that there was no way you're going to get young, bright Nigerians 
to give two years of their lives to teach in disadvantaged schools. And so this idea of Teach for Nigeria really, we're looking to address educational injustice. We say that no child, like every child, regardless of where they come from, whether from a rich background or poor background, whether from the south, north, or west, every Nigerian child should have access to equitable education and quality education. And how we're doing that really is by recruiting our most outstanding young leaders in Nigeria. We're training them, we're supporting them, and we're placing them to teach in some of our disadvantaged schools and public schools in Nigeria. And so we launched our program in 2017 with 44 fellows who are teaching across schools in Lagos and Ogun State. And this year, we recruited an additional 172 fellows <laughs> who are teaching in Lagos, Ogun State, and Kaduna State across 80 schools. And what they are doing, like, you know, a lot of times people say, so are they just teachers? But no, we call them teacher leaders because they're in their classrooms teaching for these two years to ensure they impact the lives of the kids and put them on a different life path. But beyond two years and after, the goal and the aim of the work we're doing is to channel the energies of these bright individuals into the education ecosystem. So, for example, they're going and driving policies to, to, to address equitable education in this nation. They're going and they're de deploying technological solutions to improve and enhance education. They're going and they're sorting out nutrition and healthcare because they believe that that is one of the things that is hindering access to quality education for some of the kids in the communities where we're in. So in a nutshell, really, we're a leadership development program for education in this nation. Thank you. Very, very impressive work you're doing at Teach for Nigeria. It's obvious to me now that education is the vehicle that is going to transform this country, transform the continent, and it's very important that we equip Africans, young Africans, for us to deliver this. Also, SME is a backbone for any economy to thrive, so it's important that we don't downplay all of this. Not to forget the theme, which is equipping young Africans for social transformation. I'm going to move straight to Olufumbi now and ask, since it's a recipient for one of the platforms that has made this possible. And I'll just um, go over some of the things I thought you might want to share with us today. When I first met you, I think that was in 2013, and you were serving at the time doing projects in secondary schools, and you had come to LEAP at the time for some support, and that's how I encountered you. So I've known Fumbi for a while, very passionate about young people. But today the story is different. You're a man of many portfolios, but even more than that, you are one of our alumni today of the SIP, and it's very... Um, impressive to see what you've achieved and also how the platform is helping you. But we want to know today, what is your story really, apart from what I've just shared? What, what motivates you and what helps you to continue to do more for Africa? Thank you so much. My name is Olufun Bifala. Uh, I have my background in, my background is in computer science and economics. Um, right after I left school, before NYSE, um, my, my first job was as a product analyst in an IT company. And then I, you know, my goal, I mean, my job description was to develop a school management software for secondary schools, specifically public secondary schools in Lagos State. Uh, at the point of deployment and engaging the students, you know, you can imagine walking to secondary schools, secondary schools and seeing kids not in, not in class. Every time we went to school, students were not in class, teachers were not in class, when students showed up, they showed up late. Imagine students showing up at 11 o'clock. And it was a concern for me. At that level, I started to see the level of decay uh, in, in the secondary school system. So I told myself that I wanted to do something about it in a little way that I could. And someone advised me to start a project when I was doing NYC that I'll be able to get more impact. Um, I started Project 4 when I was serving. So Project 4 basically was a project that is, was called Project 4 Club basically for student, secondary school students to get engaged and you know, teaching them about um, leadership development, um, how to solve problems in, in their immediate environment, uh, and, and then IT skills. Luckily for me, I mean, I couldn't do that alone. I wanted to do it in eight schools, but I just couldn't do it alone. It coincided, I mean, it was at the time that um, NYC had said that you coppers would not work in corporate organizations anymore, that they needed need to work in schools. And so there were so many core members that were doing nothing, absolutely nothing in schools. So I used them. I, I leveraged that network to, in, to train them using LIB. That was when I met LIB. 
um, you know, lead, help me train the students, I mean, the court members, and they became my resource persons in those schools. So to cut the long story short, um, the project was a six-month project that culminated in students solving problems in their immediate environment on campus. And that was very interesting, you know, it was very interesting because a lot of people were doing projects on, in, in secondary schools, but it was all activities. And this, for, I mean, the way that people saw it was more pragmatic. People were, you know, allowing students to solve problems in an immediate environment that they would never have had the opportunity to do so. And imagine students trying to renovate their, their libraries. The students who have never used a library before, and, you know, they've seen their contemporaries in other schools use libraries. You know, people wanted to renovate their libraries. People wanted to have dusters and dustbins in the classroom, things that schools should normally have, but schools don't have. And, you know, I did a short video, put it on YouTube. After a few weeks, I got a call from India that said, oh, this is fantastic. They wanted me to come replicate in India. Um, I was flown to India, all expense paid, and uh, I worked with the Indian government for a while. And basically, in, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, there was no way I would do this project sustainably. I didn't see the money. I just didn't see it. And I, and I just wanted to do something more sustainable using my background in technology. So working with the Indian government allowed me to see how the Indian government was putting a lot of money in supporting entrepreneurship and innovation in the country. You know, supporting people who were returning from Silicon Valley who wanted to solve India's biggest problems. You know, from poverty to, you know, gender inequality and all those stuff. And, you know, seeing people with that kind of educational background solving real problems, I just thought to myself, I mean, we can do this. So um, at the time, you know, Aki has mentioned the level of uh, unemployment rate in Nigeria today. At the time, it was 14 percent. And you see how that has gone right now, 14 percent in 2013. Um, so I, I pitched my idea in India, and I got $30,000 from the Swiss embassy in India. If you go on YouTube, you see the video. And right now, um, the vision has changed. But I mean, you can see the way that I was thinking at the time. I came back to Nigeria to start Passion Incubator. So basically, the goal of Passion Incubator is to support and invest in Nigerian entrepreneurs who are going to solve some of Nigeria's biggest problems across sectors, from education to, to healthcare to, to agriculture. Uh, today, so far, we've invested in 27 companies. Um, some of them, you know, right from the point of idea, from ideation stage to now employing people and, you know, at, the, at growth level. Um, if you ask me what we do, we, we basically just say that we work with corporate organizations, government institutions, international organizations, embassies to design startup programs that allow us to manage and implement so we can continue to support entrepreneurs across Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, from your stories, there's a gap. The youth call members are vehicles as well that we should be looking at. But before I come to that question, I have to really talk to Inkem. Your story is similar to that of um, Fumbi that I just shared. You are a social entrepreneur yourself, and it's very interesting the work you're doing with Mama Money, which is your initiative. But I would like you to share with us today, why is it important for women? Why is it important for you to equip women? How do they tie together? women and youth development? How does it tie towards social transformation? I want to also hear your story, your journey, your motivation, and how you're looking forward. Okay, good day. I'm um, Nkem, founder of Mama Money. So at Mama Money, what we do is we empower low-income women with um, free vocational skill acquisition, um, we provide mobile loans to them to kickstart their businesses. And recently, we started um, a dishwash company that employs only low-income women. So you say, why Mama Money? Why women? For me, um, I'm passionate about women because um, of my personal story, and I've shared this um, on a lot of platforms. Uh, my father, we lost him like 20 years ago. My mother was a full-time housewife with no skill and no finance to start a business. So feeding in the house was a big challenge. Going to school, even transportation was a big challenge. We had to trek a whole lot of distance to get to school. And at a point in my life, I had to go to make money to support my mother and my younger ones. I had to go to sell in the streets of Lagos, Balo, Goa, Swane. I had to become a house help to even get money to pay for my my YEC fee. So I said to myself, when I become, when I'm big, 
You understand? I have plenty of money. I want to help women. So after I finished my school, um, the lady I helped um, taking care of her children, she said, come back to my house. I need someone to stay with my children. So I went back to stay with her. And then she used to work with um, Equity Bank. So then I staying with her in the house. They said they wanted no counters in Equity Bank. And I applied, and I got the job. So working in Equity Bank, that's how I was able to do my part-time program and started working in the bank. And I was waiting till I had a lot of money. I wanted money so that I would be able to help women. But this money was not forthcoming. And I also wanted to that's effect change in the lives of women like my mother. But the money was not coming. So and at 2012, I resigned from my job. And I had a small shop. And every morning, while working in the bank, I used to leave the house 4 a.m. So when I stopped working, I'll leave the house around 8. And when I leave, I'll see a lot of women outside doing nothing. See some of their children running about. Madam, what thing happened? Why is your waiting? Your picking no go school. Ah, no money. So I'm like, ha, what will happen? And my mother is like, she is a widow. She doesn't have, she's like Mother Christmas. So when we have like 10 derikas of rice in the house, before I come back, it's two derika. Mommy, what happened to the many? It's, I don't know that woman. They don't give up. I'm like, no, this can not continue. We need to um, um, impact this woman. So I took the whole money that I'd made in my, my shop. I looked for a resource person, and I printed flyers in my community. And I shared the flyers, and I said, if you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, just a woman, and you want to be empowered, come attend this training for free. So, and I used my zonal center, my church. I spoke to my pastor, and he agreed, and I used that place. And that's how we, we started empowering women in um, different communities. So from then, using my personal fund, my husband, people didn't really understand. They're like, you, you are looking for money. You are helping people. So, but when they started seeing the change the, in the lives of the women, they bought into my dream. And we started getting different kinds of um, partnership from the US Embassy in Nigeria. We attended the Leap Africa Social Innovators Program, helped me to hone my skill. And as an outstanding social innovator, we got one million naira from Union Bank. and. <laughs> And we used that one million to kickstart because we wanted to create this factory. Because during our course of work, we realized that not all women, low-income women, want to start a business. Some just want a place they can go to and they get money, 10,000, 20,000 naira. So I used that money. And while doing that, I was selected for the Aso Villa Demo Day, where we got to meet the president. And through that partnership, I, we got another fund to help us establish the factory to full standard. And we did that in Lagos. And um, this year, the Edo State Government said, Mama Moni, we love what you are doing in Lagos. Come help us replicate in Edo State. So also, right now, we have another factory set up in a rural community in Edo State where 10 low-income women are employed. And um, not only low-income, we have um, one of our staff, she is, um, um, a disabled person, she can't really speak. So having her, because nobody will employ her. So in that factory, we've actually trained that we've built their capacity. So that's, that has been our, our journey. So majorly, for me, like they said, 70% of Nigerian women are poor. And I'm working, it's not, poverty is not in Lekki. Please, come to Makoko. Go to Okwafo. You need to see the women there. So if nothing is done, if these women, their capacity is not built for them to start generating income to feed their family, their children, they are going to become a big challenge for the communities that they live in. So basically, we empower these women so that they can feed and educate their children. So imagine if I had not had the opportunity to go to school. Imagine. See, look at, because of education and because of education, look at the change that I've been able to effect. So imagine 100 mama money all across um, Nigeria. Imagine what that would do. So that has been my, my dream. I can really see the picture, yes. definitely. Uh, I think that story is very, very 
impactful. It's touching me personally. You know, it made, and now you have many awards. You've been locally and internationally recognized. That is amazing. Very well done to you. I, I want to follow up on your, your statement on Mama Money, but there's one element I want to bring out, which is how you do this. I know your model is FinTech. Okay. What, do you, what do you want to share around the number of women in fintech and why it's important for women to be in that space? Okay, for us, basically with our um, fintech platform, we're trying to provide access to finance for women who cannot go to the traditional bank, commercial banks, because of they lack collateral, they lack um, credit history. So for us, what we did was to create a platform, mamamoney.org, where... Um, Individuals go there to lend 20,000, 30,000. They lend, and we take this money and we lend it to the women that we work with in different communities. So that's how it works. So we, we uh, recently we just launched our USSD code where a low income woman in Makoko in Okwafo will be able to use her future phone to request for loan, to pay back a loan, and to save. So that's what we just did. And it's important for us to support these women because if you look at majority of the female entrepreneurs in Nigeria are low income female entrepreneurs. So they cannot go to Lagos Business School. They cannot come to Leap Africa. But what we are doing is to help them build capacity. So we need a lot of people like Mama Money to come say, right now we're working in only Lagos and in Edo states. So imagine all the other states, the women, they are missing out. So we need other women because for us, we are able to design products that suit our women because we listen to them. We are asking them, what do you want? How should this loan look like? How, when will you pay back? So they pay back quickly. So we're able to design these products because we listen to them and to be good at other women too come in because as a woman, you know what you want to use your money for, how to design products to suit women. Fantastic, fantastic idea. Um, Olufumbi, what exactly is social entrepreneurship? I mean, it's started around. People say social entrepreneurship. People say social innovation. I want you to expound on that a bit for us. I mean, social entrepreneurship is an ability to identify a social problem, right? Um, and the ability to, to solve those problems. And at the same time, stay sustainable. And, and that's the big mistake that um, social innovators have made over the years. And that's why people come and people go. You know, and, and for me, and, and, and that's why at the beginning of my career, and that's in doing Project 4, I always try to think about, yes, the goal is to solve social problems, but how do you do it in a sustainable way? At the same time, you keep the impact at the intent. So, so, so social entrepreneurship, in my own opinion, is the ability to identify a real social problem, the ability and the capa capabilities to solve them and still stay sustainable so you can grow and, and impact more lives. Thank you for that. My question now directs to Akintunde, and that is, you know, when you made your presentation about what you're doing as LSETF, you mentioned that you really work with SMEs. So I'm going to ask now, do you think your agency can begin to consider working with social entrepreneurs or make social entrepreneurship a pathway for how you are stimulating youth transformation? I mean, I think at the heart of solving this problem is obviously a clear framework around partnerships. Um, and so, I mean, as an institution, we're very clear that governments will never have all the solutions. Um, and so we've got a very open framework uh, to partner with a lot of social enterprises. Um, so in Kem, for example, whose story I always, every time I hear her say it, you know, it, it sounds like I'm just hearing it for the first time. Um, sits on our Lagos Innovate Advisory Council. Um, and it's, it's because we understand that she has won a personal story of using technology to deepen access to finance and inclusion for low-income women. Uh, Fumbi, who's across the table, Passion Incubator is one of our partners on our innovation framework. Um, I wish I could have said Teach for Nigeria, but that's a conversation that hasn't landed yet. Um, and so the, the point is for us as a state government, um, 
we were very keen to see how we can work with social enterprises. Um, but, but ultimately, I mean, I think the challenge is you've got to recognize that, and this is not even a Nigeria problem in itself, it's a regional problem. Um, you've got to also recognize that every party in this conversation must come with a level of accountability. Um, and that's a critical point that people often skirt around, right? That ultimately, as government, we need to be accountable to taxpayers. We need to be accountable to the people. We need to be able to demonstrate that this is the best use of government's resources. Um, and I think that's something that we, we don't necessarily deal with, where resources of the state are sometimes utilized suboptimally. So, so part of what I like, for example, budgets, for example, is one of a social enterprise that I am incredibly excited about. You know, because I even tell my guys at work sometimes, I say, you know, this money you want to spend, like Sheung Onik Bide is my friend, but the best I might get from Sheung is that he might call me five minutes before he clicks send and just say, hey, you know, there's a storm coming your way. We just realized that you guys spend too much money on coffee. You know, so, but it's important that these kind of institutions also keep government honest. So on one hand is the partnership element, on the other hand is also holding government accountable. Um, but then I think finally the one thing that we haven't also done enough of is to see how we can do some corporate linkages um, because I think there's a real place for for-profit businesses to participate. Um, I always say two things that I find very interesting in the SME space. One is including small businesses and micro entrepreneurs in the f value chain of large corporates is something that I don't think we do enough of. And even when we do that, how quickly we pay them um, is a fundamental problem. And this is not just a corporate problem, but this is also a government problem. So, so to round up, I think it's two things. On one hand, it's to find how we can continue to pa partner effectively um, with social entrepreneurs. But on the other hand, it's also for a number of social enterprises to also develop solutions that keep governments and keep even private businesses accountable to, to the communities. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, I like the topic of accountability. We, we always negate that part when we are discussing system and structures in Nigeria. And so I think that for us is very important to hear today. Uh, from the table, we've heard so much about the work we're doing with SMEs, with women and children, education. But I think that there are more problems facing us than the SDG that we have today. And so my next question is to follow it to really ask you, are there critical areas that are emerging that you think we should collaborate on to enable youth transform successfully or lead social innovation effectively? So I'll take that question from the work that I'm doing and I will share with you just some of the things that we're seeing in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So we started our program in 2017, and September we deployed our first cohort of 44 fellows to teach in public schools. And these are bright, young individuals, outstanding graduates, young professionals, and they were placed in the schools to teach. And um, once they arrived in the school, some of the issues that they started to face first was some of the fellows, as we call them, the participants of our program, 90% of their students in the classrooms couldn't, were not literate. And that was one issue. Another issue was under-resourced classrooms. There were no furniture in some of the classrooms. The kids are there on the floor. Um, there were no books, no textbooks or notebooks for the kids. Learning aids were not available. Another issue, one recently, actually, it's a pattern that we've discovered now across all of the schools, is like the girl child who is coming to school and um, who is not going through her menstrual period knows nothing happening, has no knowledge of what is happening with her body. So she comes to school and she sits in the corner and she's just not going to participate that day because you know, she's shy, she's timid, and she'll wait till the entire school leaves before they start to crawl out of school. And this was something they were seeing across schools. It was affecting attendance as well, and these young girls just wouldn't come to school. And so we got into, and just as I said, Teach for Nigeria is focused on addressing educational injustice. And so when you begin to sort of like unravel the different nuances that is affecting quality education for kids who come from low-income backgrounds, you see that it's deeper than just the education itself. 
There is a role that the health sector needs to play. There's a role that policy and governance needs to play. There's a role that the school leadership itself needs to play. Technology, I mean infrastructure, the guys who are putting together the budget and planning, you know, how money will be spent for the nation. There's a role for everyone to play. And that's why at Teach for Nigeria, we recruit people from diverse academic backgrounds. Because to truly solve this problem, we need people across all sectors to fully understand what the issue are and to see how from all these different sectors they can play a role towards contributing to solving it and so for example I'm going to share a story of um, teach from teach for India of a fellow who was a doctor and went into the school to start teaching and he realized how kids he was teaching didn't have access to quality healthcare um, services. And so what he did after his fellowship program after two years was then to set up an insurance system where these kids from their family will pay as low as say 500 naira per annum and they could access private hospitals around their communities. And so the idea for us is to truly fix and to sustain um, the, the, the solution around educational inequity and injustice. We need to build collective leadership across all sectors. You know, so it's me and you, it's everyone in this room. And so with the program that we're doing, it's really to expose these young minds to the issues. Um, it's to expose them to how, I mean, they're going to live it firsthand. They're living in the communities, they're breathing this and engaging with the family of the kids and the kids themselves. And so post two years, it's going to haunt them for life. So even if they found themselves working in consulting, even if they found themselves work, you know, running their own businesses, somehow they're going to continue to play a role and do something towards educational inequity. Thank you for Lawe. I think we will also want to engage with people in the room. I would like that you direct your questions forward as we continue with the panel session. My question goes to Fumbi now. Um, is to bring it back to how can someone initiate a social enterprise or a social venture? You know, there are some roadblocks or challenges. I know we don't like to talk about our failures as much as people talk about their successes, but I think it's gainful to know what are the things that people who want to venture into this sector or launch out a venture like this should know uh, would face them when or confront them when they start out. So, I mean, let's be clear. Uh, even though some of us don't say our initiatives are social enterprises, it's actually a social enterprise because we solve the problem of unemployment, right? Um, the idea that, I mean, the question is how do you people navigate uh, those roadblocks? Those roadblocks are there, and you know, Dr. Pratit has mentioned it earlier, that just understanding and appreciating those roadblocks before you even start that journey is very critical because those problems would exist. I mean, we almost shut down shop two years after we started, and that was because you know, the, the businesses that we were supporting, we were investing in, you can imagine, they were raising funds, they were employing people, they were revenue positive, they were making so much money, but we, the supporter of those businesses, which couldn't even turn on the light. So just understanding the, the need to continually innovate and find new um, you know, revenue streams and innovate the business is critical, right? So we see that happening all the time, and when we work with these businesses, we see you know, people, I mean, let's be fair, a lot of these entrepreneurs are first-time entrepreneurs, never worked in a corporate organization before, never interned anywhere before. You know how the education system is. You know, internship doesn't really mean internship, right? So when people have the passion, people want to start businesses, the passion is there, but the, 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 the capabilities, the, the ability to really implement and, you know, run those businesses don't exist. And so understanding that those challenges exist, understanding the need to acquire skills, and to learn, you know, as much as you do, you know, and get someone where you can learn from. Because at the end of the day, you know, the statistics are, you know, when we started five years ago, we always hear this stuff, I mean, the statistics of nine businesses out of 10 fail. It wasn't wrong. And there was a reason why, why those businesses failed. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about how much money they couldn't raise. Sometimes you see people raise funds and they still fail. And when we look into the nitty gritty of that failure, it's always about how they can't just execute even when the resources exist. So number one would be, how do they appreciate the, those challenges? How do they navigate through those challenges? How do they acquire the right skills? And how do they also learn in that journey? It's very critical. Thank you so much. 
the problems ahead of us are really, really daunting if we look at them critically. And it's very important that we collaborate and you know, begin to think inwardly, how can we create the future with, with the roadblocks ahead of us? But I will go on and ask Akitunde now the question I have regarding embedding social transformation into our system. How can we go about this? What can you say about that? Um, so that's a very broad question. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally, so there, there are a number of touch points that I, I, I worry about. So Fumbi talks about, and I'll start from the entrepreneurship perspective and shed some light. So Fumbi talks about a, a class of people I like to call accidental entrepreneurs. Um, and the, you know, first things first, I, I went through university within a one kilometer radius. Or in fact, I went through my first three schools within a one kilometer radius at the University of Lagos. Um, primary school, secondary school, university, at not on one day in those three schools, which you might consider pretty decent institutions, um, did I learn anything about entrepreneurship? All right, not one day. So I went to staff school, I went to ISL, I went to Unilag. And I, I mean, my first degree, my undergrad was in economics. My, and the, the challenge is, so when you've gone through high school, you've gone through university, and then you don't have a job in three years, you're not prepared to be an entrepreneur, of course the business is most likely going to fail. Um, and because the networks are also fairly weak, so how do you find the right mentors? You know, how do you find the right support structure? Um, and so part of what we are trying to do is to be what, if you've lived in the US, an SBA is. You know, create small pockets of support for businesses in their localities. Because if you live in, and you know, in Kem says Makoko, but you know, if you live in even Alimosho, right, and you run a business in Alimosho, who do you talk to? You know, there's nobody to talk to. There's, there's no support, support structure. Um, so I think my fundamental challenge is first, our educational system is fairly rigid. Um, and I remember someone saying to me, um, he wanted to set up an online university in Nigeria. And when he went to the NUC, and I might lose my job for saying this, the NUC asked him, you know, to bring a large expanse of land, you know, bring X number of buildings, and the guys like, guys, you know, this is this is effectively open courses, right? And they're like, fine, whatever you like, you can call it. You must have that building, you know. So that rigidity and that lack of flexibility is a big challenge, you know. Um, so where the curriculum isn't reviewed over 10 to 20 years, it means that it's not adjusting for cultural nuances, right? So I mean, today I've got two kids who are five and two who are learning all sorts of things off YouTube and all these places, right? And you expect them to then end up feeding into a public university where there are 50 computers for 40,000 students. It, it makes no sense. So, so I think that level of flexibility socially is the fundamental problem, that we're not adjusting with the times as, 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 as we, sh we could. I think the other thing, and in terms of just, there's a, there's a value signaling that I think as a society we still, we still suffer from. Um, and one of, I always use my personal experience. I'm in my third year in this role at the Employment Trust Fund. And in the last, I mean, obviously now, because of certain political reasons, more than before, people come to me and remind me and say, you know, your term is almost done, oh. You know, you haven't made money yet. You know, when are you going to make this money? You know, let's do something together. And, you know, so, so and when you're a public servant, you know, who's, not issuing contracts every day. You, you, they say you are stupid. But, but that's because the, the society will give honorary degrees. Um, so when people who are clearly unable to explain their sources of wealth come into rooms, we stand up, we defer to them, we celebrate them, and then tomorrow we say the country is corrupt, there's no value system. You know, we, we are the problem. You know, this is not an EFCC situation, right? You know, this is a situation of, look, when I was in primary school, if you stole, right, you had this thing where you had I am a thief on your back the whole day. Wow. You know, it was a big disincentive to steal it at, at staff school in the University of Lagos, because you never wanted that. Even if you like the pen, you're going to be like, nah. But there's no, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no signal now. So the signal is, you know, you do what you can, you get away with it, everybody forgets. You know, we say, oh, the new cycle is quick that by next week, someone, you know, the guy has forgotten about you. So, so you know, the, the challenge is, we, we can't outsource that situation. I think there's an elite problem there. We who are the elites have to start that signal in ourselves. Um, because when all these people, when Inkem tells this fantastic story, right, and she does this great work, at the end of the day, someone is going to say to her, you know all these women you are supporting, 
You know, you can start going on holiday. Or, you know, people, your mates are going to Bahamas. They are going to Bali. You know, why are you wasting your time? People are slaying on uh, Instagram. Why are you wasting your time doing these things, supporting women in Makoko? You know, so, so the truth is, I, I, what I like about this kind of event, and I think that it's, it's, it, it's more than stuff like this, but it's important to celebrate people who are doing the real work. And discovering those people is a real job. And I think that that's one thing that I think institutions like, like LEAP can continue to do. You know, find people that we often don't talk about and celebrate the work they are doing. So to close, you know, I'll, I, always, I, I follow this guy on Instagram who runs the Humans of uh, New York account, right? And um, when, it's interesting that when he was in Nigeria, within my circle of influence, people were doubting the stories. You know, they were like, ah, no, this, this, is not, this, is, this guy is glamorizing poverty. This is not Nigeria's story. But the moment he went to Ghana and he went to Rwanda, we turned back that human face, right? We're like, oh, these are really touching stories. But the ones that affect your country, you find it difficult to believe. Because when you live in, when you have an event, and so now I'm going to hit you guys a bit. So when you have this great event in Lekki, you know, this is a nice place. When you're coming in, you see the waves. You know, it's, it's a nice and fancy situation. When you go into Makoko, when you can't hold your nose, then you know that there's poverty in the land. So, so when people say, you know, um, when people say to, to us that how do we elevate the, the, the social fabric, we, we always say, look, we only support today 8,000 small businesses, right? But the little we can do is to ensure that the 8,000 people who have benefited from our loan program, not one person has had to call me. No one person has had to call anyone on our board. No one, one person has had to call anyone on our management team. Now, we don't expect that we're going to solve the problem that way. But what we want to do within our own institution is to say, look, we're going to set a standard for how things should be done. Now, five years later, we hope that someone who's in university can say, hey, you know, some people did this thing this way. They made some mistakes, but overall, their hearts were in the right place. And we can build over that. And to what Patrick said before he left, is, you know, this is a continuous journey, right? One of the reasons why many of us are doing what we're doing is because there are problems that we want to solve. We might not solve those problems, but we can at least build enough that helps the next person solve the problem. And I think that's the way you've got to look at this thing across different generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So many things were coming at me as you were speaking, particularly the, the humans of New York that uh, happened recently was blowing up. And I really can relate to many of the things about society, about corruption, how we as people are also contributing to some of the problems. And it's becoming even clearer that the system can only be adjusted with both of us, myself and yourself inclusive, being part of that. Um, I have a question from the audience for you, Inkem. I'm going to start with you. Thank you all for sending your questions to us early. Uh, the question is that, how do you recover loans from beneficiaries, considering the fact that sometimes when you borrow them, they may not pay them back? Okay, so for us, um, we try to build a relationship with the women. So that's why, you see, we go to their communities. So we are not saying we are in Okokomaiko, you in Badagri, come. So we go to their communities, we go to Okwafo, we go there. So if I'm giving a woman a loan, we have group leaders. If she's a troublesome woman, they'll say, I don't give that woman money, or she'll go beat you before you collect your money. So they already know that, okay, she has collected loans from maybe other small financial institutions. So that's how we get those women, we, we train them. So we help them build their skills so they have like, a skill to generate income, and we also do financial um, training for them. So we are teaching them how to record their sales, how to record their expense. Those are the things we do for them before we give them the loan. So they are in groups, so every day they all know their leader. So every week they get to pay back to their leader. So that's the former arrangement, but with the new platform we launched, they can actually do it themselves. Yeah. Amazing, the power of technology. Yeah. Question is here for you, Fumbi. Someone wants to know, how can social, young social innovators be part of Passion Incubator? So, I mean, we run our programs. We currently have a program, a call for application right now. So if you have an idea, you can apply, which is funded by the World Bank. Um, for entrepreneurs in the southwest region of, of Nigeria, you can apply. From time to time, we collaborate with um, corporate organizations 
Um, so for example, the banks, we have, we, we're going to announce three partnerships with the banks, so FCMB, Diamond Bank, and Standard Chartered, where we're going to roll out um, problems that the banks face, that they want entrepreneurs who are solving problems along those lines to apply. You also know. So I, I would say that follow us on, I mean, sign up in our newsletter so you get to see, be one of the first people to see those opportunities when they pop up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Fumbi. There's a question for Folawe, and that question is about money. How does Stitch make money? How do you handle that? Well, that's the biggest challenge. It's how do we fundraise? So we are not profit and we fundraise to, to, to fund our program, the program that we run. And so really it's through philanthropy. It's individuals who are truly passionate about the work that we're doing, who have supported us so far. Personally, when I joined Teach for Nigeria, I joined Teach for Nigeria with a contract in hand as the program manager. I worked when I realized just how much in the organization needed for it to actually happen. I gave up two years of salary to actually be able to run Teach for Nigeria, and I came from a full-time paid employment. And so there is a, an amount of sacrifice or a level of sacrifice required to really, if you say you want to do social transformation. And I remember the first year we had thought, you know, corporate organizations and foundations will jump at this idea and just throw money at us. But in the first year, we, didn't, we couldn't get a corporate organization to support Teach for Nigeria. There was no foundation that was ready to support. So again, people want to see results. They want to see, they want you to prove the concept. And so um, our first corporate organization, corporate partnership came this year, and that was PWC. And then after that was Sterling Bank and then FBN Quest and then several other organizations that we're now talking to. But one of the things that I've continued to do with my team is to build a diverse funding base. And so now, for example, we have foundations that we're talking to that are interested in funding us, but we're purely um, constantly fundraising through donors. And another thing that happened successfully for us that a lot of people had said wouldn't happen is actually we get some sort of support from government as well. So all the public schools where we're placing our fellows, the government also contributes towards the stipend of the participants, um, and they have them on their payroll system, and they also pay them monthly like their teachers. And obviously that also wasn't, um, it, didn't, it wasn't a walk in the park. It was really just getting the buy-in of the government officials, Ministry of Education, the State Universal Basic Board, and just in inspiring them that this thing really could work. And so from there, we got them, people cannot really see how possible government would also fund the work, but I tell you, all the state government that we're working with also contribute towards um, the payment of fellows' salaries. Diversity, diversity. Thank you for sharing so much about how you're doing that. Uh, there's a question for Inkem, and that is, at what stage did you identify that you have become a social entrepreneur, or how, or at what stage did Mama Money itself become social enterprise? Okay, so initially when I started, it was just basically to help the women in my community. And um, so I attended um, a training where um, I was told that, okay, this stuff you're trying to do is called social entrepreneurship. So for the NGOs, you have to fundraise and fundraise. And because of my personal background, when there was no money, we had to go begging and begging people for money. So I said to myself, no, I want whatever I do to be sustainable. So when we started lending, so we actually um, charge interest on the loans we give our women. So from the loan, from the interest, we make little um, profit to help us run our social enterprise. Then with the factory that we just set up, with funds generated from our sales, we can actually run um, different programs. Okay. Um, on the leg of that question is, how do you guide against default? And I think that question is mm -hmm. taking it back to loan and reclaiming your loans. So for defaults, so like our women, it's like when I work, you know, ah, mama money, they don't want to, maybe for now that we are small, most of them know me. So they actually take this phone because nobody's helping them. So when they see that, will I say, um, somebody throws them a lifeline, 
They don't want to misuse that lifeline. So you see, most of our women, they pay back. And for us, sometimes people meet us and say, Mama Money, I know you, you are empowering women. Okay, give me 23 of your outstanding women. I want to give them grants. So we take, we go to different communities, we choose our women, and they are giving grants. So we've done like for like almost four times. So the women are saying, ha, if you pay back your money, sometimes they go dash you money. So that one, the word of mouth, helps us, those women, they want to pay back, they don't want to default. So that's what has helped us for now that we are small. Very innovative in camp. Thank you for that. There's a question for Akitunde here, and that's around your own um, loan scheme as well. How do you manage the default rate at? So I was hoping to get away without answering that question. Um, I mean, unlike, unlike in camp, one of the challenges you find with lending is that as you scale, collection becomes a bigger problem. Um, and then understanding and assessing the risk um, might, becomes magnified. So for us, the first point is of collection is in identifying who we lend to. Um, and so the, the fact that the system is very democratic, very transparent, means that we don't carry a moral hazard of lending to people we know. Um, but in, in any portfolio, you find that there are always people who are either unwilling or unable to repay. In some really bad cases, you have a mix of people who are both unwilling and unable. Um, for those ones, we have a very simple solution. So Lagos State has just started a small claims court. Um, thankfully, and we didn't influence this, um, it allows you to bring cases of up to 5 million naira, which is right at the upper limit of where we lend that. Um, so anyone who's owing us and we feel is unwilling to repay, um, they should be receiving their papers right about now, between today and tomorrow, um, because the signaling is very important. So, so Inkem has given you the clear example of positive signaling, that if you pay back, you might get a second loan, or sometimes they'll dash you money. You also need a bit of a stick, where if you don't pay back, someone actually comes to you and drags you to court. Uh, because we have seen incidences where people have said to us, oh, you know, uh, but this loan is government, I'm an APC member, you know, I'm like, well, good luck, good luck with that, you know, say that one when you're voting at the ballot box, but this one, you've got to repay your loan. So, so you know, there's, there's, there's that part where you've got to be very hard. Um, so we use, right now we're very, we're not a bank, so we won't bring, like, policemen to hound the people or anything like that. What we just find is that we look for some of the better borrowers. So we work through associations, we work through community leaders, uh, we work through people who have trained some of these beneficiaries, so not-for-profit organizations, who know these people and have trained them are good acquisition partners for us. Um, the, the other thing is, we also find that when we celebrate some of the successes, so we also help these people succeed. It's not enough to lend them money, you've also got to be able to open up markets for them. Because there are genuine cases where people are not defaulting because they want to. It's just because certain economic conditions have gone against them and they can't repay. In those instances, we're happy to sit down with the people and restructure the loans to make the, payment, the repayment terms a lot more comfortable. So, I mean, I think at the end of all of these conversations, the truth is um, we find, for example, that our micro loan book is outperforming what you might call our SME loan book quite significantly. And, and it's counterintuitive that, that that's happening. But it also tells you, when you think about the micro lenders, they're losing a lot less money than commercial banks. You know, so, so these guys, for people who the business is their lifeblood, right? It's their source of, not just income, but it's their source of sustenance. It's the only reason they're alive. Um, it's a lot harder for them to think about defaulting on their loans. It's when you go up the ladder, where people then have the luxury of saying, you know, this is a limited liability company. You know, I'm a different person from the business. You know, we can end up in court for five years, or I can always go and talk to the lender. That's when you tend to find that sometimes, and then they tend to really have more competing needs for their money, right? So, you know, there's always school fees to be paid. There's Ashwabi to be bought. There are all these competing needs. So you, you tend to find that at the bottom of the pyramid, it's a lot easier for us to collect. These guys are not defaulting on their loans as much as, um, as the, the small businesses. But again, I think Inkem has answered that point. It's a signal, it's a carrot and stick. You repay your loan, we give you a second loan. You don't repay your loan, we drag you in front of a magistrate. 
Thank you for that. I have a final question for Olufumbi. I'm sorry I can't take any more questions at this point. And the question to Fumbi is that, what motivates you or what continues to motivate you through your work? Can you share that with us and we wrap So, up? I mean, I always tell people that if I didn't get the opportunity to go to India to earn my skills, I'll probably just be a random developer somewhere. You know, maybe be behind the desk in the bank so, I mean, what motivates me is the fact that I knew that someone gave me an opportunity and I just want to see other people succeed. So, whenever I wake up in the morning and I realize that people want to solve problems that plague us in this country, I'm more than happy to give them an opportunity to do so. Thank you so much. I want to thank all my panelists for this impactful session. I have learned a lot and I hope you all did. Thank you. Thank you so much. A big round of applause.